And it's this amazing exhibition that I'd really encourage you to come and see. And it's a temporary exhibition. It's called Geology Through the, Through the Lens. And it's a temporary exhibition that features photographs that capture over 300 rare and historically significant geological landscapes and specimens that were taken by a range of geoscientists over many years. And there's special fossil so how these talks gem. came about was, oh, I'm hearing myself echoing. There we go. <laughs> um, and the exhibition also features special fossil gem and mineral specimens. And they're on display at the museum. And uh, there's a really nice um, dinosaur replica experience as well. So it's lots of fun and, and, and a, an amazing amount of, of geological specimens that are really beautiful. And I'd really encourage you to come and see the exhibition. And the exhibition was created and curated by Professor Joel Drennan, Bruce Ken Cross, uh, uh, Prof Richard Fulyun, and the late Prof Morris Fulyun, Catherine Clay James Plainhans, and Dr. Ian Mackay. And um, it's a wonderful e exhibition that is co-hosted by the Geological Museum Association, the WITS Faculty of Science, and the Earth Sciences Cluster here at WITS. So it's on till end of September, so you still have more than a month to come and see it. And Origins is open, business as usual, we open Monday to Saturday from, from nine to five during the week and on Saturday and public holidays, nine to four. Um, and yeah, you can book your tickets online on web tickets or, or come in, but yeah, all COVID protocol apply, but please do come. Uh, the tickets are 81 Rand uh, for, for adults, for VIT staff and, and pensioners at 66 and for kids it's 40. Actually no, VIT staff is 40 as well and students so and exhibitions if you're only coming to see the geology exhibition at 60 rand but otherwise you get to see the whole museum uh, that has just been renovated we use this time to do that but let me go on to introduce our speakers uh, we have two speakers for today uh, they are dr bernard zipfel and dr Ian Mackay. so i'll introduce them both um, and then we'll give Bernice a chance to speak and then we'll have a chance in between to have um, uh, some questions after Burns talk and then move on to Ian. Okay, so Dr. Bernard Zipfel is the University Curator of Fossil and Rock Collections at the University of the Witwatersrand in Johannesburg. And he curates all the fossil and rock collections housed at the Evolutionary Studies Institute and School of Geosciences. His main research interests lie in the biomechanics and evolution of the human foot and the origins of hominin bipedalism, paleopathology, and the preservation of natural history collections. Dr. Ian Mackay is an education and outreach spe specialist at the Center of Excellence in Paleo Sciences and the Evolutionary Studies Institute, Heritwitz. He has a PhD in paleontology and a teaching diploma. Ian is also one of the South African Council members for the International Geosciences Education Organization. He is passionate about promoting sustainable geotourism and involving the public in the geosciences with his outreach program called Paleontology for All. Ian has over 24 years of experience in education and public engagement science. So you're in for a treat today. I think these, I'm really excited to listen to these talks as well. So yes, as I mentioned, um, the talks are going to be about 20, 30 minutes each. And after Burns' talk, we'll have a, a, a chance for some questions. You can type your questions in, so you won't be able to um, put your video on or anything, but you can type in questions um, and, and then I'll read them out and, and get Burn, Burn and Ian to answer them. Cool, so over to you, Ben. Yeah. We just can't hear you, make sure you unmute yourself. There we go. Great, take it away. Can, can you hear me? Okay, sorry, my screen's not advancing. Cool. Yeah, it's going forward fast. Okay, there we go. Okay, cool. Right, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Hotchkiss Reynold, for that introduction. And thank you for the opportunity to address the GeoTalks uh, folks. Um, I started uh, working at WITS as a curator uh, about 13 years ago. And one of the first things I was handed by my predecessor, Dr. Mike Roth, was this little box that said, R.A. Dots, Australopithecus and Pebble of Many Faces, X Makapanskat. I had no idea what this thing is. 
He said it had just come back from overseas from an exhibition. I think it was in Austria. And I should, on my first day, make sure it goes to a safe place in the collections. And then I said, but is it a fossil? He said, no. Is it an archaeological artifact? Uh, not really. What is it? It's just a stone. And uh, I was kind of intrigued with it. So I'm, I'm speaking more from a curator of this material's point of view rather than a scientist. And that is what it looks like. It's, it's, it's a very pretty pebble. And uh, between 2.5 and, and, and 3 million years old in terms of where it lay, it's of course much, much, much older than that geologically. And it is of jasperite um, or um, bounded ironstone, as it's also uh, known. And yeah, it's, it's been lying around and it seems to be accessed by a number of people or people that want to see it, but normally from a science point of view for all the wrong reasons. So let's chat about that a little bit. It comes from the Makapan Valley, a place called Makapanschat in the Limpopo province. And it's a beautiful valley and it's very well known for its hominin fossils in particular. And of course, a lot of other um, extinct fauna that used to live there between uh, 2 million and 3 million years ago. And this is an artist's impression of a painting that's up in the bottom of our, our collections. And unfortunately, I couldn't see the artist's name on the painting, although I used to remember it, which is probably quite a nice depiction of what the valley looks like because it, it hasn't changed all that much. One could imagine looking at it these days and seeing all these prehistoric uh, fauna moving across the valley. And here one could imagine an Australopithecus um, most would say Australopithecus africanus, standing up and observing the valley with the uh, animals that are now extinct and some of them which we still have today. Um, that's more or less what the cave looks like from one of the angles, and it's it really a, a quite a spectacular place. Um, there are a number of, of hominin fossils that come from the site, unfortunately very fragmentary. Um, this is Australopithecus prometheus, the holotype. In other words, it's the specimen that defines this particular species, which is quite unusual that it's just a small cranial fragment. And that was uh, discovered by uh, Raymond Dart in 1949, but does represent an important specimen. Here's another example of a, a lower jaw of an Australopithecus, which Raymond Dart felt represented violent behavior in our ancestors. You'll see there's a crack over there and there's a crack over there. And he gave demonstrations and very passionately spoke about this was when we started beating each other to death and we've inherited that. Subsequently, it's found that these cracks were purely taphonomic. In other words, the way these fossils formed caused these cracks and breaks and had nothing to do with violence. And in fact, we can't find any evidence among these hominins of being violent towards each other. There was also the so-called ODK, the Osteodontokeratic culture. That's the, the um, bone and the horn and um, nail um, uh, culture, where Dart also felt that these hominins made various bone tools and tools from horn and bone. And uh, subsequently as well, there's a, a huge question mark whether that's the case, that these were formed in other ways, other than hominins expressly producing them. Coming back to the so-called Makapan pebble or Makapan cobble, um, it was first mentioned by W.I. Eitzman, who was a school teacher who used to rummage around Makapan's hut and uh, wrote quite a nice succinct little paper on some of its geology and then he does mention of having found this water-worn pebble um, of jasperite um, and noted that it was foreign to the Dolomitic Caves. So Dolomitic Caves are the typical caves in which hominins are found here in South Africa. Um, very, very old geology, but very new deposits. Uh, and he uh, took it out of uh, bone breccia in, in the level three breccias. And he uh, thought it was very pretty and hung on to it, looked at it for a while, and then thought that perhaps it was something that was carried to this cave um, by a, a hominin. 
uh, more specifically Australopithecus, which I find interesting because this was just a few years, he wrote this paper just a few years after the Taung child was found uh, in 1925, and this was written in 1957, and Australopithecus was not a thing yet. It was not recognized as a hominin at the time. Uh, this is what it looks like. You can see on the left, that's the front. There's no front and back on this, but that's what people generally think is the front. It's the pretty face. And on the back, you see something else. And um, yeah, it takes a while to get used to that. Uh, coming back to Raymond Dart, he was originally handed this pebble to look at, and he thought it wasn't anything of real interest. And he more or less ignored it. But several years later, when he discussed this with Eitzman, he uh, had another look at it and decided to write a paper on it. And he called it the water-worn Australopithecus pebble of many faces from Makapanschat. And he also wrote quite a succinct, specific paper explaining in a fairly emotive way that when he looked at it more closely, he thought he saw a face. And then he turned it over and he saw another face. And he hypothesized that perhaps it was carried by an Australopithecus into the cave, and that's where it lay buried, and together with um, fossils from other hominins, very fragmentary material, and um, he thought it was of interest and uh, um, represented an interesting uh, hypothesis, and he did this only in 1974, so he had some time to think about it. In his illustration, he explains in the top left one over here, that that was the first thing he saw. Then he saw a very high forehead, as you would find in modern humans, distinct eyes, and a gaping mouth, and a touch of a nose. I think all of us could probably see that. He then turned it a bit in the light, and he said the profile changed a little bit, and the eyes kept on looking at him. So something like a prehistoric Mona Lisa. <laughs> Then he flipped it over, and that's when he thought this was really interesting. He said it went from this sort of kind of juvenile face to an elderly face with this very wide smile, and uh, the nose set forward, sorry, the nose set forward with the two eyes over here and a lower forehead, and he felt when he turned it in the light, either way, it looked like something more like one of our ancestors or one of our relatives that was not human and had a brain the size of a chimpanzee and a lower forehead and a generally more ape-like features. Um, I took this and, and my, my friend and colleague Ilza van der Merwe took some photographs for me. She's a museum photographer and just turned the light a bit on it. And I thought I'm going to get a very glamorous change of what it looks like. And Sure is nuts. It kind of looks the same to me. I don't see any dramatic change from the front and the back, maybe a little bit like to me, the one on the bottom right looks a bit more friendly than the one on the left. And sort of having a look at it and thinking, would any of us see any of these, for example, the one on the left as a human face, and the one on the right as a hominid face, um, if we kind of stuck eyes in there and a sort of a bit of a smile, I don't know, it, it does take some imagination. Now keep in mind that this particular specimen was found together with Australopithecus remains in Breccia. In other words, it had been there for two and a half to three million years. But there is no jasperite associated with dolomites. This jasperite came from a place closest about 4.7 kilometers away, although Raymond Dart in the paper I just showed you said it was 32 kilometers away, presuming that whatever brought it there would have carried it the long way around. Then in 1998, um, and I think this was the last sort of scientific approach to this particular um, um, artifact, was by Robert uh, Bednarik, who uh, traveled to South Africa to have a look at the specimen and uh, took great interest in it. Um, he explained the geology of the area and also looked at the geology of the actual 
um, pebble, note that he refers to it as a cobble, which in fact is the correct term. I think a pebble is slightly smaller and its granules are of a slightly different consistency. So um, in fact, Benderich approached it more scientifically and called this thing a cobble. So he spoke about a long complex formation of the cobble where there's an interplay between the various erosion processes. He found in dolomites in the presence of hominin remains. Um, so it couldn't have been washed into the site uh, at that particular time. Uh, it could only have been carried there from about 4.8 kilometers away, which I think was more accurate than Dart's rather dramatic 32 kilometers. And it's the only Pliocene object of its kind which could be referred to as paleo art. And at, at this particular point in time, I think by modern standards, people would be very critical of what uh, Bednarik thought. And to date, this is probably the only paper that still would believe that this represents some form of paleo art where an ostropithecin had picked it up in a riverbed, looked at it, thought it was very pretty, and actually carried it with as a memento back to the Makapan cave where it stayed with the ostropith till the end of its days and was found with the remains. Um, it's a very nice thought, but it is fraught with all sorts of problems. Um, in South African Dolomitic caves, most of the hominins we find, they didn't actually live in those caves. They were carried in by carnivals. So um, one wonders what, what, what may have happened. Um, subsequently, um, my experience in the last 13 years has been the people who have taken an interest in the specimen were all people who had an interest in art. And they love the idea of saying this is the oldest evidence of art. Um, so ben Benrick, apart from looking at from a scientific point of view, also <laughs> liked the idea of looking at Pleistocene paleo art in Africa. But anyone who knows anything about art, and I don't, uh, is would know that art is defined by something that's created by somebody, not something you just pick up in the field. Uh, we can't just pick up a rock and say, ah, a piece of art, I'm going to put it on exhibition as art. It's not, it, it remains an artifact. So that's the first thing. The fact that um, Bednarik himself examined it very closely and said this thing was naturally formed. There was no indication that it was modified by anybody. And uh, from my point of view and most others, this is not art. In 2016, um, we were requested through a very long and bureaucratic process by the Natural History Museum in London to borrow the specimen for a very big exhibition uh, together with a number of other African artifacts, some of them being pretty important, like the Mapungupwe um, Golden Rhino, and there were hand axes and all sorts of really interesting things. And I tried to tell them, but are you sure you want to put this little pebble on display? They said, yes, and we'll get you to speak about it. I said, I'm not going to speak about it because it's just a pebble. And uh, they put it on display in London, and it was quite a hit. It was extremely popular, and pilgrims came from all over the place to come and pay homage to this little cobble. And uh, subsequently as well, there was a, a, a book that came out on the right, which had it featured on the front cover, First Sculpture, hand axe to figure stone. Um, surprisingly, they never acknowledged our, our, um, our institute for the loan, but acknowledged everybody else. But they put it up in a very interesting uh, display. And apparently, because I didn't see it on display, the light that hit it from various angles made it look um, quite, quite glamorous. Um, this is where one comes to the term, the, the term uh, pareidolia. Pareidolia is when you start seeing things in objects that aren't those things. And I think it also includes things like taste and smell. It smells like, it looks like, etc. In this case, you've got um, Mars over here with a, a face on it. Um, we all know it's not a face, but I think most of us, even when we are normal and haven't smoked anything, uh, would say it looks like a face. But obviously, logically, we would think there's no way a face could be put there, although others would think the face was put there by some Martians that were creative. Other examples of pareidolia uh, would have been the Tantan figurine. Uh, this one came from Morocco, 
And that indeed had some modifications over here and over here where the dotted lines are. And it's thought to have been made by Homo erectus, and that's between 300 and 500,000 years ago. So it is not really comparable to the Makapan pebble, although it falls into that classification, but this was indeed modified. It also showed a species that lived millions of years before the Makapan hominins and were probably capable of such things. Another example was from Berakat Ram. Uh, which is um, placed between Syria and Israel. Um, to me, that doesn't look like much, but there was also apparently some modification to it. And these two examples, I think realistically, could be defined as the world's oldest evidence of art. There are a few others as well, but these uh, are quite well known. And that is because, firstly, they came from creatures that cognitively were capable of doing modifications. And secondly, these are natural items that were modified and are then recognized as art. So uh, I bumped into a place um, just two hours northwest of Tokyo um, a few years ago, I think it was in 2017, in Chinsekikan, um, which is known as Japan's Hall of Curious Rocks. And I was fascinated thinking of the Makapan pebble and walking into this place and seeing literally 1,700 Makapan cobbles, most of them natural stones that were picked up that appeal to pareidolia. In other words, you, you like to see a face there and you start seeing all these little faces. These are all natural items just picked up as they are. And they made it into this museum. I think it's the only place in the world where you, where, where you get that. that that's in a, a, a Chichibu, um, the Chin, Chinsekikan Museum, if you ever get a chance to go there. And uh, this was one of the items on display. And for those of you who do not read uh, Katakana, uh, this is Elvis. Do you see Elvis there? But this is Elvis. And these things, they actually have a cultural name for. It's the Jin Men Seki, the rock with the human face. Um, so there you have it. Um, but it does look like something. And keeping in mind that we would be the only species on Earth that would actually recognize Elvis in this case. None of the other apes can do that. So uh, in order to, to finish off quickly, just some thoughts here. And um, it, it feels like I've sort of just rambled um, quite randomly. But just to finish off, some thoughts. Pareidolia is a thing. We know it in modern humans. All of us at some point are guilty. It is not considered to be a pathology. But it can be extreme in some cases where uh, people start seeing really weird things. And it's not because they've been on any, any substance, but their state of mind would, would create them to do that. But it seems to be a very advanced psychological phenomenon. Our brains are complex. We have reason. We're always thinking. For a creature that has a brain not much larger than that of a, a chimpanzee, Pareidolia is probably unlikely. Yes, apes probably do recognize things as being something it isn't, but it's highly unlikely that they would have picked this up, looked at it, and thought it was a face. Uh, something else I wanted to say on that. Um, yeah, so we're talking about an awareness and a likeness, and mark making may be the beginnings of art. So generally in the art world, they think that the combination of this awareness and likeness, keeping in mind that artists are very creative, if they don't suffer from a little bit of par uh, um, pareidolia, they would uh, not be very creative. But it is controlled. And then added with some mark making, that's where you start looking at art. These two core directives um, were things that developed our ancestors into what we are today. But probably it's a little too early for the hominins associated with Makapan Kobol uh, to, to have been associated with this kind of behavior. I mentioned earlier as curator, I've had a number of people who wanted to look at this, and I was hoping someone would come and revive the science behind this. 
one or two people have tried and thought maybe they, they should check whether, um, you know, it really traveled that far or if there's any way it could have washed into the cave three million years ago and so on and so forth. But they found the papers available through DART et al. Um, they basically cover these bases. Um, what I have had is other people that tend to be slightly uh, new agey who want to come and touch it. They see a spiritual connection to it. They want to photograph it just for fun. And that's one of those rare moments where we allow non-scientists to take these photographs because otherwise this, this cobble would serve no purpose. And uh, then, of course, we have a lot of other people who visit us here at the ESI bringing a box, asking us to please be very confidential. They're going to show us a new discovery they made of a new species of hominid, and we need to please help them how to process this without them um, being chased by the paparazzi and uh, this sort of thing, and what they do with their millions when they get to sell it. And they'll open the box, and they'll haul out a piece of rock and show it to us and say, here it is. And you look at it, and question mark, and they say, hmm, don't you see it's a skull? Clearly, there's the eyes, there's the mouth, there's the nose. It's an extinct hominid. And you look at this thing, and for the life of me, I cannot see it. And there's certainly no bone there. Usually looking at geology that runs into, uh, you know, hundreds of millions of years old, and certainly not even close to anything that would represent hominins. And it becomes quite embarrassing, and this happens quite often. And uh, I was hoping to start a little collection of pseudo fossils, but these people actually want to take it with them because they're quite angry and they want to get a second opinion from somebody else, but then we don't hear from them again. So it's one of those things. So in terms of the Makapan uh, cobble or pebble, as some have known it, we just don't know. But it is a lovely hypothesis. And we hope to have people still show an interest in it, regardless of what we think it is. Thank you very much to Vitz Geosciences for hosting this. Thank you. Well, cool. thank you, Ben. Would you like to turn on your mic? I don't. I know you don't want to, but I'm going to make you, <laughs> so everyone can see your face. I think um, my mic's on. There we go. Uh, I mean, your, your video, your camera. Our video. There we there go. We go. Hi. There we go. Yay. Put a, a face to you. <laughs> um, that's, uh, that was a great talk. Thank you so much. Um, it, makes me, it makes me think of, like, it would be a great feature in an Indiana Jones movie or some horror movie. It's got this, uh, it's, it's very cool. <laughs> um, okay, so I'd like to ask the audience if any of you have any questions. I've seen there's something in the Q&A. So others of you, you're welcome to... Uh, start typing in the chat or in the Q&A. Um, a message from Charles Day. Would you, a question, would you rate the giant footprint in Pumalanga Limpopo an example of pareidolia? pareidolia. Um, that's a good question. It, it probably is, because I think there's not a, a human in, in sight that would actually not see that footprint. Um, but most of us would know that it's not actually a giant footprint, that it's a just happens to be a geological artifact. But yeah, I think that probably is a, a form of uh, pareidolia. Yeah. Um, and then a message from Lou Ashwell. Um, he says that, that he gets the same public reaction to meteorites, meteor wrongs. So obviously people coming to say, it's a meteorite, it's worth millions. <laughs> oh. Yeah, that, okay, that's one then, of the things that Jules had to deal with. There's people who think they can sell them for millions. Uh, yeah, I'm sure. sure. Um, but uh, Gillian says, thanks for a great talk. Um, I Also, I wanted to, I think that it's quite interesting. You know, I deal with, with ochre and, um, and dealing with early hominins and, you know, early homo sapiens and those questions about, you know, were these homo sapiens 100,000 years ago the same as us now cognitively? Um, and there's such a focus on red ochre. And so it's quite interesting that it is this beautiful red stone as well um, that you do think, well, maybe a lot of the ochre hasn't been used. It's been brought back to the site and maybe, maybe handled, we don't know. Um, but yeah, it is interesting to think that it's maybe not even 
the face that was important, but also the color. Well, T- Tammy, I'm, I'm glad you've mentioned that because I think one of the hypotheses, and I actually haven't seen it in any of the publications, it's probably there somewhere, uh, is that in fact, it may have been an archaic Homo that brought it up the hill and dropped it somewhere and somehow it managed to be integrated. The problem is I think it was fairly in the breccia, although there's no proper record, there's no photographic record of it, no mapping. So that could be the other thing that in fact, the red jasperite attracted a a, a more recent hominin to find it attractive. And I, I can buy that, but still a little dodgy on how it actually got into the cave. Yeah, yeah that's true. So all the, the Makapanshat, um, is there all the material that fits sit in the ESI? Uh, as far as I know it is, there's probably quite a bit of Makapan uh, fauna that might be overseas um, at various other institutions in the days when people used to export things without permits. Oh, sadly. Okay, uh, let me see if there's any other questions. I think there's one more. Uh, Wendy Kutsia says, I see faces and shapes in my Slasto floor all the time. <laughs> by suffering from pride or yeah. Well, Wendy, I'm really pleased to tell you, you are not suffering from any condition. You are just using your imagination a little bit, which is great. Where the problem comes in is when you really believe they are faces and you call one of us to have a look at it. And then you say, can't you see there's faces in the Slasto? I've been there and done that. And that's embarrassing. Then then we say you have a problem. But other than that, you, you're suffering from periodolia, but it's not an abnormality. And you're not suffering from it. You just have it. Yeah. <laughs> All of us do. Should. Yeah, and I definitely see faces and things as well. Uh, then from Joel Drennan, there used to be a lot of fossils up in the shed at Makapanskat. What happened to those? Um, at this time, I think it's only breccias that are up there. And they'll probably always be up there. Um, they are fossiliferous. But we have literally tons of fossiliferous breccias from Makapanskat here that um, we're not sure how to process because these things were removed and the context was not always carefully um, uh, reported, which is a shame because there's a lot of fossils that are essentially lost. But I don't think there's prepared fossils up there to the best of my knowledge. Sure. Yeah, and I went, I went to um, the valley and, and, and the caves a few months ago. And it was sad to see, I mean, because they're amazing. And, they're, and I mean, on the whole, you know, all the, it's, it's been well protected and, and kind of looked after and clean, but definitely not people coming and, and not, not well maintained because there's not a lot of people coming. And so it's a pity about all the, the politics that has gone on around the site because it's an amazing site still for, for tourists and for, for researchers. Okay, should we go on to Ian? Are you ready, Ian? Do you want to share your screen? I'm ready, I think. Great, cool. Let's hope this is going to work. There you go. Okay. Right, can you all hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Your screen just That's is great. taking a little bit of time. How's that? That's perfect. Go ahead. Okay. So my field of paleontology is paleoentomology, the study of fossil insects, of course. And one of it's a little known fact that actually at the ESI, we have quite considerable collections of fossil insects from all over, from South Africa and Botswana. And when you're studying fossil insects, you come across all sorts of kind of weird and bizarre facts about them, which I thought would make a fun talk to share with you. So hence the title of my talk, 15 Amazing Facts. And I don't know if they're really facts or factoids or what you'd call them about fossil insects. Right. So I think the first thing about them is that they are mostly pretty beautiful if you find nicely preserved ones. So at the ESI, we've got a large collection of fossil insects that were preserved in a crater lake from the Arapa diamond mine in Botswana. And this is a codified compression of a fly. And I just hope that you are blown away 
by the detail on this thing. If you can see the actual eyes and the little facets, the compound eyes with the little omatidia, the simple eyes, the mouth parts, and right at the back here is a reduced wing, a whole pair. If you look very carefully, and I hope it's not like the pebble of many faces, there actually are little CT or little hairs on it that are very finely preserved. This is probably, I'm not a fly expert, a fungus um, gnat, a tiny little fly they used to, they can swarm around, irritate people and cause agricultural damage. Now we have many, many beautiful fossil insects like this. And I'm going to show you a couple more in this presentation. So fossils also, together with genetic evidence, show that insects are actually a type of crab. Well, let's simply put they are closely related to crabs or fairly closely related. So take a look at this fossil insect here. Okay, it is actually a 120 million year old mayfly nymph from Brazil. And next to it is a modern mayfly nymph. Very, very simple. And can you see on the rear end of these little, of these um, insects, are these paired appendages which function to help for walking, taste, and as gills. Um, so just imagine that fossilized gills, these very, very soft parts preserved on this very, very ancient fossil. And this is what a mayfly adult looks like. So this little um, nymph is going to metamorphose into an adult that looks like that. Now, most of us, when we think of insects, think of these things. And when we think of crabs, we think of crustaceans, and we think of these things. And, and, and but this with that arrow is pointing is actually where insects fit in. So that's a brine shrimp, shrimp. And it turns out that insects are most closely related to these little creatures here called Remipedia. And they live in saline coastal water. And they were first found in the Bahamas in 1979. And genetically, they're most similar to the insects and their close relatives. There are about 17 species of them found all over the world. And if you look at them, they've got these little paired appendages all along the length of their body. So I hope you can see the parallel now. Um, these ancient fossils and modern mayflies have got little gills along their abdomen, and remipedes have got very similar looking structures all the way down their body length. So from the fossils and from the genetics, we get this evidence that insects are actually a type of crustacean, really, or pan-crustacean is, is a technical word for them. Now, fossils also provide clues for the origin of wings. Where insects got their wings from is a um, real mystery. We have um, bats, pterodactyls, and insects, some of the few groups of animals that have developed the power of flight. Now, if you look at these fossils, which are even older than that mayfly that I showed you, they've got lobed appendages down the entire side of their body. And interestingly, in some of the fossils, the ones at the front are larger than those at the back. So these are about 320 million years old. So it seems that we've got evidence just from the fossils, and this is supported by genetic evidence, that insect wings will I'm sorry, but I have got a technical problem here. Evolved from gill-like appendages similar to the Remopedia. And you can see these large carboniferous insects that have got lobes on the prothorax, um, which is not where you usually find wings, suggesting that the wings and the gills on these insects um, are just identical to the Remopedia ones. 
Now, also of interest is that the oldest fossil insect or supposed fossil insect is this pair of 400 million year old jaws, which are preserved in Chirp from Rhiney in Scotland. And they have got structures. You can see um, the articulation or the hinges of these jaws and the serrated surfaces that are very similar to the jaws of modern winged insects, which led researchers to propose that the first or the earliest modern insects actually had wings, which is kind of counterintuitive if you think about it. And more recently, it's been argued that they actually weren't insect jaws, but they belonged to a millipede. And that makes sense because we have to wait 80 million years to find the next winged insect fossil. <coughs> Also, those early 320 million year old insects or 300 million year old insects were actually rather large. They were, and um, this is a proto-odonopter model. Try to sort of move on. We have a, but anyway, these early um, mega neuron dragonflies had a wingspan of up to 70 centimeters. And today, the largest insect you likely to come across in terms of wing size is about 10 centimeters. So they were extraordinarily large. And it was, people used to say that it was because the concentration of oxygen back in the Carboniferous is much higher than the concentration of oxygen today. But the isotope studies reveal that the oxygen levels have stayed more or less the same. And today, most paleoentomologists think that at the time, there were no large vertebrate predators. So the, the alpha predators of the time were these large dragonflies, which probably would have been eaten if they had tried to fly around in the skies later on. And another myth that you come across is that cockroaches are living fossils which have survived over 300 million years and they can survive a nuclear explosion. Um, well, actually, those early cockroaches are only superficial, similar to the modern cockroaches that we have today. And one of the things that distinguishes them from our ones is that they've got this long tube that they use for laying eggs, an ovipositor, which you certainly don't find in cockroaches today. And if you've ever had a cockroach infestation in your house, you would have noticed sometimes the females carrying these little um, bags of eggs behind them, which is one of the dis distinguishing features of modern cockroaches. And the first modern type cockroaches appear only 200 million years later. In other words, they're 100 million years old, and they are beautifully preserved in um, amber from Myanmar. Another interesting thing, if we look at the fossils, is that often you get very similar forms appearing at different times in the geological time scale. So if you look at these fossils, you would immediately say to me, ah, those are butterflies. And they do look very similar to modern butterflies, but actually they belong to a completely different um, group. Relate the lace with in, lace winged insects, you might know the antline larvae that you see in the felt sometimes in that little funnel of sand and their kin. And these, they belong to an extinct group called the Caligrammatus, and they lived in the early Cretaceous and uh, middle, between the early Cretaceous and middle Jurassic. And they even had tubular mouth parts, scales, look at the eye spots, the shape of the wings, um, which is very, very similar to the modern butterflies that we're familiar with flying around today. And butterflies like this, oh yes, and there's, that's a modern lace wing. That's what, more or less, what an adult um, ant lion looks like. And there a caligrammatid is, hmm? just like a butterfly. And actually the first butterflies that really, really modern butterflies that look like caligrammatids only appeared 55 million years ago. 
and this is a very beautiful, it's said to be the best butterfly fossil ever, is 40 million year old Prodryas Persephone, and it comes from Colorado. Isn't that a beautiful specimen? Of course, parasites always fascinate people, and the idea of when the first fleas and lice, for example, appeared is an interesting question. Well, we get these things, which resemble fleas, um, 165 million years old, and they actually have got these large mouth parts for sucking and these very really big claws up to two centimeters long. So a normal flea is only about three millimeters at the largest. And it's thought that these, these claws and these, this mouth part were actually for kind of penetrating the thick, thick hide of dinosaurs. Uh, and there's... This one on the left is from 165 million years old, and the one on the right comes from the Cretaceous, also possibly dinosaur feeders. Lice are also interesting, but we have to wait a long time for lice. Oh, and then I forgot to say that proper fleas have been reported from 100 million years ago in Myanmar and there. And here we have your fossil lice. The one on the left, it's preserved in um, fine, fine man's fine, fine mudstone, and the one on the right is an actual living mice, la laos, <laughs> and which feeds on swans, geese, and duck. You can see how similar they are. So fossil lice only appear about sixty million years after the fleas. And the Guys that reported this and described it thought they could find, see the actual remains of a feather inside this lice. But I think this is like a pebble of many faces. It takes a bit of an imagination to see it, if you look carefully at the tip of that arrow. Now, another fascinating um, story that has surfaced is the idea of zombie ants. So these ants, so zombie ants, well, the unzombified ants are actually carpenter ants that live in the forests of Thailand. And unfortunately for them, in those forests, there's also this vicious parasitic fungus, which infects them and takes over the nervous system and causes them to crawl up a tree sort of 25 centimeters above the ground. And then they move along a leaf and bite onto the midrib of that leaf. And there they stop. And then the fungus appears and grows out of the head of these little ants and spreads spores all over the forest floor, infecting more carpenter ants. Now, that's kind of a bizarre story, but from a fossil point of view, they actually leave a very characteristic damage around um, the mid vein of the leaves. And that has been found in the fossil record. So if you look at, to the right where the arrows are pointing, they look rather like stitches on the veins of these leaves. And that is very distinctive of the damage that these zombie ants inflict on the leaves. And so these have been found in the tropical rainforests of Germany and exactly similar to the forests of Thailand today. And those the Eckfeld Mar fossils from Germany, very, very beautiful. Another thing that researchers have been doing is looking at insects and trends in insect evolution over time. And what they've discovered is they can't really find evidence for mass extinctions like the ones that we see in vertebrates in the past. Um, and so it appears that insects were not, didn't really disappear, they didn't become extinct en masse, but rather one fauna was slowly replaced by another fauna, a kind of faunal turnover. So, for example, the end Permian mass extinction is said to be the mother of all extinctions, right? Um, <clears throat> when 90% of marine species and 70% of all vertebrate families disappeared rather rapidly over about 165,000 years, but for insects, you gradually see 
the giant ones that I showed you earlier on being replaced by modern insect faunas. But of course, today, there is another e extinction being caused by humans, which is of more concern, and I'll talk a little bit more about it later on. Now, if you think, talk about fossil insects, you just have to mention amber. And this is an exquisitely preserved 100 million year old fossilized fry from the Myanmar amber, 100 million years, right? Okay, and many thousands of insects are beautifully preserved in amber. You get little frogs, you get spiders. They found remains of um, Cretaceous birds, all sorts of amazing things, ticks filled with blood. And before you ask me, no DNA has been found in any, any of these insects. Although some early researchers in the 90s thought they had, and that's what inspired the movie of Jurassic Park. Right, so um, amber is actually fossilized tree resin from certain cone bearing trees and also from some legumes. And it's become fossilized, it becomes copal first and then amber. And the insects in this amber are so well preserved that they can you can compare them directly to modern species. The first fly that I showed you is beautifully preserved, but to actually identify something and classify it accurately to species level, you really do need the preservation of amber, unless you're very lucky. And so using um, amber, it's been possible to show that you get living insects or make the most amazing living fossils. You get species that are many, many millions of years old. So some species have survived for millions of years like the telephone beetle in this picture that I'm gonna tell you about a little bit later on. And some genera are over a hundred million years and families go all the way back to the Jurassic. So just think of how vertebrates have changed over a hundred million years. I wonder how many vertebrate species are still extant. Whereas we have many, many examples of modern insect um, genera that go way back into the Cretaceous. So this telephone beetle, is rather extraordinary because it is. It's remained unchanged for 20 million years and it's got an incredibly bizarre life cycle. They live in rotting wood. It's been rotted by fungus. And normally, if you break into that rotting wood, you'll only find female larvae. But every now and again, maybe because the rotting wood is drying out, the female larvae sort of will um, metamorphose and form female adults or else they might lay eggs, which develop into male adults. And these male adults, the eggs sort of lie right next to the larvae. The larvae go into some sort of torpor. And the, those larvae, those adults, those male adults will actually eat their mother from the inside out. And they don't appear to have any function other than that, other than eating their mom. So maybe because they are found in rotting wood and the rotting wood environment has stayed the same for a hundred million years, maybe that's why these insects have remained unchanged for so long. But we can use these insects as incredible, the, the um, stability of insect species as rather incredible paleoenvironmental indicators. So this little beetle is a water scavenging beetle and it's found in marshes. And these and communities of like-minded individuals preserved in peat bogs have been used very successfully to use the tracks, to track the movement of glaciers in the UK during the last ice age. So when the ice retreated, then the beetles would retreat. And when the ice went forward, they would go forward and you've got different communities of beetles in as these um, as the acid sheets retreated and advanced. So Helophorus, one of particular species of these, are today actually found only in the tundra regions of Eurasia. But 13,900 years ago, because the whole sequence has been dated very accurately with carbon, they were found in the Midlands of England. And 
Then when the glaciers retreated and um, the climate got warmer, then you would get beetles from Southern Europe or Central Europe being found in England. And then as the ice advanced, you got beetles from the Arctic regions being found. So the beetles are able to actually give you kind of an average summer temperature for that time, at the time when the fossils were preserved. And they track the retreat and advance of the ice sheets more accurately than vegetation, which wasn't able to keep up with the rapidly changing environment. So those are my 15 factoids about fossil insects. But I just thought, although insects seem to be very tough and make up more than half of known species, some ecological surveys have, no, have noticed a more than 70% decline in the number of insects in only a few decades. And these are surveys in um, Puerto Rico and in Germany. And there's also the popular story of windscreens that, many, that years ago, if you drove down the road, your windscreen would end up being covered with insects, dead insects. Now, if you drive down the road, you very, very seldom have that same result. And just think of all the things insects do for us. For example, without insect pollinators, civilization would collapse very rapidly. I know some technologically minded people who are creating mechanical bees that they hope will um, pollinate all our crops. But I mean, really, and just think of all the other species and the position that insects play in ecological networks. Without them, we'd be in trouble indeed. But anyway, so I hope now you feel inspired and you're going to go out and hug a bug. Don't stamp on it. Don't get your doom. Hug a bug today. And yeah, thank you very much to um, the geosciences for organizing these talks, to the Origin Center and ESI and COE of Paleo Sciences for supporting some of this research. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ian. That was fascinating. I learned a lot. Um, cool. So we have a, a question from, from Lou Ashwell. He asks, beside from the amber examples, how did such delicate features get preserved so well? Um, seems to be the secret is in very, very, very fine mud and rapid burial. So insects, uh, so you get basic, two basic types of preservation. And other than in the amber, it's, they're usually found in lakes. Um, and so the insects will land in the lake, they get carried by water currents to the side of the lake, and there they, you need rap, rapid burial before they get eaten by anything or um, yeah, decompose. And just that rapid burial, and it must be fi fine photolithographic clays that result in that fine deposition. Yeah. I mean, fine preservation. Yeah. <laughs> um, do we have lots of examples in South Africa of insect preservation? Yeah, we, we've got fossils from the Karoo, especially from the Triassic, collected by the Andersons, all sorts of exotic things. And then the ones from Arapa, from Botswana, which are the, it's actually the only Cretaceous um, deposit of fossil insects in Africa. Oh. Yeah, and the ones from the Triassic, also very old, very abundant, and all sorts of interesting information coming out of them. Uh, we have a question from Adam Midzuk. What is the evidence and what seems to be the reason that insects seem not to be majorly hit by mass extinctions? Well, I think maybe those little beetles that I talked about at the, at the end of the talk give us a clue because they seem to be pretty good at tracking their, their habitat. So these great big glaciers are advancing on them. And in front of the glaciers, you get a tundra region and then you get more temperate regions. And the beetles don't just hang around and wait for the glaciers to crush them, they actually move around. And so they're able to track their preferred habitat. They're also very small and just a little tiny micro microclimate and that's sort of favorable to them will be good enough to keep a population going. Um. We have a, a comment from, <laughs> from Lou Ashwell, who's um, saying, does anyone else notice a resemblance between Ian's handsome countenance? I'm sure it's the bald head 
and and darts cobble. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, very rude. <laughs> well, you know, I was I'm going to work on that beautify filter that you get for Zoom. I think I think I need to work on that one a little bit. It's also the, the shadows in your camera because your face is quite dark and the <laughs> glasses. Oh, that's silly. Okay, so do we have any other questions? Oh, one thing I actually wanted to ask was, um, and I might just not have noticed the scale because I'm thinking of these 70 centimeter large uh, dragonflies. Um, I was wondering if, um, you know, like the, the fleas and things, were they also that much, that much bigger or are they quite similar to the size of fleas now? Well, the very first proper fleas are small, yeah, but those flea-like insects were pretty big, two centimeters. I'd they hate were. to be okay. those on the dark night, yeah. Sure. <laughs> Makes me cringe. <laughs> okay, we've got a question from Mike Dormer. Do the Bockefeld mud and siltstone deposits carry insects fossil, insect fossils of note? So the Bockefeld mud and siltstone. siltstone. You know, we do get some from about that time, but I can't think of any in the book of our okay. So we get from Makanda um, and Wittenberg, but I can't think of anything from the book of book of our. But I might be wrong. And then from Robert Smith, does does the presence of DDT in environment in the environment present the greatest problem to modern insects? Um, there are a whole bunch of things. So one habitat destruction, pesticides, um, light, for example. I think those three things, um, not just DDT, but use of pesticides in general, are, are sort of being fingered as, as being responsible for the destruction of modern insects. But as far as we know, we don't, we don't know enough about insects to say that a particular species has become extinct. Um, but we can tell that the biomass of insects has decreased enormously. Oh, and by the way, I was just thinking, yeah, you can say that there were no insects in the Book of Health. And I was wrong about Makanda, in, in Makanda as well. They too early. These are Devonian. And it's way before your first proper insect fossil. So no, the answer is definitely no. Yeah. Well, yeah, it was an interesting point about the, you know, when you're driving and going on these long trips and there used to always just be so many insects on the windscreen that, you know, I remember as a kid, it was just this constant and now it really isn't actually that much. Maybe our windscreen wipe is also that much better. <laughs> <laughs> well, people have argued that it's actually the aerodynamic cars are more aerodynamic yeah. than they were in the past, but I don't know if that's true. And those studies are from the, that I talked about are from the 70s until now that they've noticed this decline in insects. Now, I don't know how old all of us are, but I think that makes sense with just that experience that you had and, and yeah. I remember too. And I don't know what everybody else remembers. Yeah, that's no, it's interesting to think of. Okay, but that was great. Oh, and then there's a, another question here uh, from Nick Cowley. Have there been any Lazarus insects like the sea that like the coelacanth among fish uh, rediscovered when taught uh, when taught when thought extinct? Sorry. So any yeah, did you understand? I think that that telephone beetle is the is the, like a Lazarus beetle in reverse. And I think the problem is we don't know of any. Yeah, I I I can't think of any other than that telephone beetle that have been found in, in the amber 20 million years and still alive today. Normally we work from what's present to the past with insects. I, I don't think we really know them well enough to mm. say, ah, okay, that this, yeah, the Lazarus beetle, I, I mean, the telephone beetle is, is the one that I can think of. I mean, it's just working in reverse, right? I'm not sure. Yeah. Cool. We're getting lots of thank yous. That was great. Um, okay. So I think we'll close the, the questions there. Um, and so then I just want to talk briefly about the, the talks for next week. So we have another series of talks with people that have been involved with the, uh, the exhibition at Origins. And uh, these are the talks that are happening next week. 
So we have Prof. Uh, Richard Fulion doing a, a talk on the GeoHeritage Tour of Johannesburg, which is dedicated to, to his late brother, Maurice Fulion, who passed away last week. And uh, then we also have Prof. Bruce Cairncross, who's going to be talking about Southern African gemstones. So a very quick tour through, through that. And, and I think, this, I mean, these talks are, are great because it's a lot of things that are discussed and shown so beautifully in the exhibition that's at Origins. These, these photos that th there's a lot and there's so much to take in when you see these photos. And it's, it's so nice to, to have all of these people uh, willing to do talks for us and to actually talk about their, their experiences and the places that they've been to and the amazing geology of, of Southern Africa and the world. Um, so yes, I, I think that's it for today, but thank you so much Ian and, and Bernard for giving these great talks and for Grant and Linda as well for um, coordinating all this with the GeoTalks. And so we will see you all again next week. It's on, on Thursday, the, the 2nd of September at the same time. Cool, thanks so much.